Green. <laughs> I've done it on my off days. John, it's good to see you. I think John is joining right now. So we now have representation of someone Hi, from John. Sunset Park. Represent. <laughs> Victor's also from Sunset Park. You, Who else? You just have yeah, Victor too, right? Yeah. <laughs> so we've got Victor and John so far. And Matt, what neighborhood? Where where are you again? Um, I'm in Prospect Leopards. So okay. just on the other side of the park. But uh, my brother, uh, sister-in-law, and nephew all live in Windsor Terrace. And I did about five years ago before I moved here. That's right. That's right. I remember you saying that when we met. Great. So we have Victor and Sandra joining. Yeah. Good evening. Welcome. Good, good to have you here, Sandra. Good evening, good evening. Good to see you, Victor. Great to have you here, thank you. <laughs> Cindy, it's six o'clock, I'm gonna start the webinar and hopefully we'll see attendees start to populate. Okay, great, sure. I'm going to go put my phone on the charger. Sure. <laughs> so I think we'll be getting started in just a few minutes. We just want to get a critical mass of our committee. I see our, our newest member, um, Joseph has just joined. Hello. Hey. How's everyone? We're good, we're good. We're, we're happy to have you as a new member to the committee. Glad to be here. Yeah. So did you, you just, uh, when did you become a, um, when did you um, get appointed to the community board? Uh, at the beginning of the year, I believe at the beginning of January. Mm -hmm. So still fairly new. And what, what neighborhood, do you live in Sunset Park or Windsor Terrace? Uh, Sunset Park, I'm by 41st Street and 5th. Great. This committee I think is about half and half, like representation. That's exciting. Yeah. <laughs> cool. It's good to, good to see Cynthia Gonzalez here. Mm -hmm. So what do you say, shall we give it like one more minute and then we'll get the party started? I'm gonna try to keep us, um, keep us on time today because I know we have a lot of community board meetings this week, um, but I'm really happy everyone's here who's here. Um, Jeremy, I'm, oh, I am co-host. Okay, good. Hey, Cynthia, it's good to see you. What is, is there like a sign behind you? Is that a picture of you? No, it's a picture of me actually, because I was trying to get this picture <laughs> so that when I'm not here, people could see me, but yeah. I just don't know how to do it. <laughs> It just, I just don't know how to do it. I can't do anything with my chemo brain. Oh. <laughs> well, I think you look great. Uh, it's kind you. of fun to see like the, it's sort of this meta experience to have like the photo and you. <laughs> That's horrible. I feel like I'm like on a green screen or something like that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, at some point I probably will get some technical assistance with this. 
I'd be happy to jump on Zoom with you if you want some help. <laughs> Um, okay, I mean, I think what we should do is get started. Does everyone feel good about that? Do we, how are we doing committee member, like uh, in terms of committee member in attendance? Um, oh, Natasha. I'll be calling, I'll be calling the room. You're muted. Jeremy, you're muted. I'll call the roll. I was asking you to call roll, but you beat me to unmuting myself. All right, so just mute everyone so I can call the roll. Okay, I'm gonna call your name and then just please unmute yourself, acknowledge your presence and I will mark you presence. Okay, so I'm gonna start with Cindy Van Den Bosch. Present. Thank you. Sandra Alfonso. Present. Thank you. Joan Body. Here. Thank you. John DeLooper. Present. Thank you. David Estrada. Get back to him. Beverly Kleiman. Present. Joseph Lara. I'm present. Thank you. Jimmy Lee. Julia Pena III. And Karen Rolnick. Okay, Victor, I will mark you here. You're not on the committee, but you're a board member. And that's everyone. So we get we got everybody who's here. Yes. Roll Cynthia, call. did we got Cynthia? Yes, Cynthia okay. Gonzalez. I got her. Okay, great. Great. Thank you. Okay, everybody. So um I just want to share uh our agenda today. Um so we have uh, are fortunate to have some guests um, from AHRC, which is a disability service provider uh, that serves our community in, in this district. And, uh, and so they're gonna start with a presentation to educate us about the services um, that they provide. And, um, and so we're gonna be joined by uh, Matthew Epstein and um, Victor Carrion. Um, I hope I pronounced that right. Um, and uh, so we're going to learn about AHRC. And also Victor is a resident in our district. And so he's also going to share a bit about um, his involvement with the community. So we're excited about that. Um, and then, and, and we're also going to learn about how we can support the work that they're doing in the community. After that, we are going to finalize some priorities uh, regarding disability services and inclusion in the district um, so that we can distribute a letter to our um, elected officials and government agencies in order to make continued progress on accessibility in a variety of areas for the district. A um, few things I just wanted to highlight. Um, we do have closed captions. If you'd like to use the closed captions, you just click on the CC button. Um, for people who are on this side of the webinar, um, please make sure to mute yourself when you're not speaking. Um, please feel free to use the raise hand function, um, or you could just raise your hand because we probably will be able to, be able to see you. Um, we don't have anyone calling in yet by phone, so I'm not gonna worry about that right now. Um, just make sure to lower your hand after you um, have the chance to speak. And if you have any technical issues, just let us know this isn't a big meeting. Um, these are the attendee controls. Um, if you are watching as an attendee, um, you can always type into the Q&A if you have a question. And I just wanted to refresh our list um, and our memories. Um, and is this, this the full list? I'm not, am I missing anybody here? I think this is the full list that I have from earlier today. Um, so yes, you're not missing anybody. Okay, That's great. Cool. Thank, thank you. Um, so, and Joseph, as we mentioned earlier, is our newest member to the committee. So welcome. Um, so yeah, so that's that's our plan for today. And I would like to send it over to Matt and Victor um, to introduce AHRC and introduce themselves. And just thank you so much for being here today. Um, we, we are looking forward to learning all about you and the work that you do in the community. 
Thank you. Well, I'm uh, Matthew Estep, um, and this is Victor Carrion. Hello, everyone. Excuse me. <laughs> Uh, and yeah, as 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 Cindy mentioned, Victor Victor lives in the district. Um, I've worked in the district. I have family in the di district, and I, I'm uh, feel very attached. Um, and we're here from uh, AHRC New York City. Um, AHRC is the um, largest service provider in the state for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, we have about five thousand staff that support about 15,000 New Yorkers with disabilities. Um, that's across the, across the city. Um, the uh, obvious question that everyone asks when we say who we are, what does AHRC stand for? Uh, I'm gonna refer back to the 70 uh, year old agency. Um, we started uh, 70 years ago when a parent wrote a letter to the post about how unsatisfied they were with the state of disability services at the time. Um, and our agency was founded to give some opportunities for those people. Historically, it stood for the Association for the Help of Retarded Children. Um, that's obviously not a name that we go by anymore. Um, we do not use the R word and we prim pri primarily support adults these days. Um, but the uh, legal implications of changing the name of a nonprofit and the history prevent us from doing that. So uh, we've, we've, kept the, we've kept the acronym and, and uh, are in the midst of a rebranding effort to, to move past the rest. Though as somebody who works in advocacy, I'm personally pretty proud of the, uh, of, of the, the history of the name. Uh, so yeah, as I said, we provide a broad spectrum of services to, to people now, um, including education. Uh, we run 4410 and 853 schools. Uh, not in, not within uh, Community Board 7, but uh, a couple of them are very nearby. Um, and we also run a higher education program uh, that gives a college experience to people with IEP uh, out of Kingsborough Community College um, and three other schools outside of Brooklyn. We also run uh, residential programming. This, there are a number of, of homes within the, the Community Board um, both ISS and support and self-direction funded housing, where people live independently with a little help um, to pay for rent and a little help from staff for with daily living skills, as well as group homes for people who need a little bit more support. Um, and home care services to help those people to be able to live independently if they might need just a little help with laundry, cooking, those sorts of things that, that we probably all struggled with when we were first moving out on our own. I know I uh, definitely made a number of calls to grandma when I first went to college. And, and those are the kinds of services that those, those staff uh, provide. Um, we also have respite and camping and rec. Victor, I know you're, you're involved in a lot of those programs uh, and uh, day habilitation, both site-based and without walls. And that's the program that uh, Victor attends and where I met him. Victor, do you want to tell everybody a little bit about what you're doing with our walls? Yeah, they have our walls. That's a program where they, um, where they, um, wait, wait, what was the question, Matt? Just, just tell, uh, explain a little bit about what the Without Walls program is. Oh, so that, program is about um well what we do is i mean we each group of five or six i can't remember which one but a couple of of clients goes out with a with a staff out in the community like you know we decide where we um want to go or like you know that has nothing to do with money or like you know that's free because right now we cannot afford um any you know any expensive things. But um mostly we've been doing we've been um going out to do volunteer volunteer sites from different volunteering and this program is where they also um train clients that for myself to find a job. I 
think that's about it. I'm not really yeah, sure. I mean, so, um, yeah, I mean, I just wanted to, to have your perspective about it since you're the one who is uh, receiving the services. Um, but yeah, we, we try to support people to be as involved as, as possible in their community, which is one of the reasons we wanted to talk to you guys as you're also very invested in this community. Um, and uh, later, Victor might have a couple of more questions if you have ideas for uh, potential places where people can go to get more involved or where they might find some cool uh, ways to get involved in the community by volunteering. So we may have to circle back to that. Well, that I don't know. But I am concerned about, you know, about uh, about the, the staff, you know, the staff issue. Like, we don't, like, I feel that not only my program, but all of the program of the HRCs in New York, you know, that they are, I, I feel that, you know, we are losing staff more than we gain a staff. And I think that is about the um, budget issue. Yeah, it very much so. is. It very much is. Um, yeah, as, as Victor was, was saying, we, we have really struggled to uh, maintain enough staff to provide uh, good supports, the quality of supports that we, we need to. And that's not an HRC specific thing that is across uh, this type of programming um, and really most forms of social support. Um, the past uh, 10 years have seen uh, pretty sy syst systematic uh, defunding of social service programs in, in New York State. Uh, many of the uh, increases in funding and reimbursement rates have, have were blocked by the previous administration. Um, so for, you know, uh, 10 out of the 11 years that Cuomo was in office, there has been a 2% uh, cost of living adjustment to all of the rates to provide these services. Um, that, that actually um, went through only one time. Um, Unfortunately, it was marked uh, notwithstanding every other year, which is essentially a uh, governor's line item veto for budget items. Um, which brings us to this year when we're very, very excited about the uh, possibility of working with the new administration, um, where we're, our advocacy agenda is looking a whole lot better than it has at any point in the past. Um, so Victor, did you want to say anything else about the staffing issue? Well, I feel that the reason why staff is is you know always want to leave is because I mean I don't what well, because they might I'm not saying you know that they you know I mean I don't like find it that they okay I know they enjoy the job but you know and enjoy helping other people with disabilities but um I believe the staff you know the staff they don't you know, like it. I'm guessing, like, like for example, um, give me a second. Um, like I was saying, like the the budget, you know, like last time, like uh, the last couple of years, you know. What I'm trying to say, is, you know, is it's more important about the staff, the way that I've been saying, because it has something to do with the pay that, that, you know, that they've been getting. And I don't think they're getting paid, you know, enough. I mean, you know, I mean, because of what's been going on with this pandemic and everything. Yeah. Um, so uh, direct support staff, unfortunately, by and large, are, are making minimum wage at this point. And those rates are set by the state. We, we don't have a lot of control over that. The, the reimbursement rate for those services is, is set into state law. Um, and it's an incredibly important job, but when it pays, the, but it's, it's a fairly difficult job uh, at times and you are responsible for, you know, for, for people's lives and there's, there's a lot that has to go into it. And it is, it is a very rewarding job, but it is a difficult job. And in the current climate, you know, you would make more money working at Chipotle than supporting the lives of, of of vulnerable people. And that's just a really untenable situation. Um, you know, when I first started, I worked as a DSP myself. Then uh, it's, it's now been 15 years, but at the time I took the job 
thinking it was going to be something that I was going to do for a couple of months while I was excited to, to let me move to a new city and that I would then find a new job once I, you know, learn the lay of the land there. And, you know, I fell in love with the work. I feel like it, I feel like I do have more of an impact than I have in, in any of the other work that I've done. And I feel like it's incredibly important, but it's very hard for any individual to make that choice when, you know, because with the economic realities of the situation, you can't live in Brooklyn on $15 an hour. It, it just doesn't work. And unfortunately that's, that's what, the, what the law allows us to pay our staff. And it makes it incredibly hard to, to fill those positions and provide good services for people who really need the help. I have nothing to nothing want to say on that note. I mean, yeah. Well, uh, so luckily, what well, um, the 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 current the current budget calls for an an increase in funding, which we're very excited about. Um, the assembly budget calls for an eleven percent increase, which would be fantastic and would let us, uh, you know and pay some much more competitive rates so we can hopefully keep keep staff um, so we don't continue to have the, the turnover issues or the vacancies that keep some folks out, out of the community because we don't have the staff to support people going out and really being involved. Um, oh, the, the other, sorry, we, we, while we were talking about the, um, they have programming. We skipped over um, the employment programming that uh, oh, HR wow. offers. Uh, no, it's not a problem. Um, there, there are a lot of folks who are working, want to work, um, and we 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 provide supported employment uh, and to help people work um, either independently in the community, ideally, um, and occasionally through social enterprise programs that we that we run. Beverly, I see your hand up. Yeah, hi, how are you? Good. Um, I have a, a couple of questions. Uh, the ratio of uh, staff to the uh, residents, um, uh, do, they, do the residents have like an IEP? I don't know what the, the age um, of the residents are, so. So we support people of all of, of all ages. Um, I am personally, I've never worked in our education department, so I'm not uh, very familiar with that. But uh, I, I know a woman who's 95 who we support and most people join our programs uh, when they age out of the Department of Ed at 22. Um, the funding for Department of Ed programs tends to be a lot higher than um, OPWDD programs. So most people don't enter that adult world um, until realistically the last point when they can stay in the DOE world. Because the funding is so much more robust for, for children in receiving Department of Education services. Uh, a lot of families describe transitioning to adult services as falling off a cliff. Um, and that's pretty realistic when you look at the money that is available to support people. Um, and for your question about staffing, uh, oh, did you have something to add, Cindy? Oh, I was just going to say, um, after we answer this question, I know there were a few things that you wanted to cover as part of your presentation. And then, and then w would it be good for us to then do questions? You have, you have. I just, think I can um, do questions now, since I think a okay. lot of these are going to be about what's going on. And then I'll talk a little bit about the policy asks when we. Okay, great, great. I just wanted to make sure. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think okay. we've got a small enough group we can. Yeah. questions as okay. They come. okay great great i just wanted to be sure thanks um the the question about staffing ratios that varies a lot from program to program um without walls programs uh it's the the ratio is ideally as small as possible um we we would love for it to be one to one one to two um that that's really ideal um the state guidelines call for one to eight and mm -hmm. which feels pretty unsafe to me to try and keep an eye out and feel responsible for eight different people. 
Um, and our agency limits the, the ratio to one to six. So, um, I see. so our programs, it will never be more than one staff for, per uh, six people receiving services, but it, it varies with other providers uh, up to one to eight. And ideally it's one to one when, when that's possible because providing support to a, a person should really be person-centered. And it's really hard to be person-centered if you're trying to center on several different people. Did, um, did COVID have an impact on your staff? Yeah, I mean, we were, that's, we were very heavily impacted in, in a lot of ways. Um, Victor, do you wanna talk a little bit about how services changed over COVID? What, wait, what? I don't understand your um your question. Can, can you share a little bit about I, how um the person that asked this question? I don't understand about it. <laughs> My question was: Did you have less staff on a day-to-day -day basis because uh, the staff was uh, affected with uh, COVID, or they were uh, uh, afraid to uh, come out? A lot of people. Uh, stayed home and um, you know didn't didn't come out to work. I mean, I don't know exactly why you know the staff has been leaving for the past like we lost. Um, I believe it was one staff last summer, and we lost a couple more staff this year. I don't know. I don't know if they you know, probably you know they might want. Because they probably wanted either to move, you know, move on to another job, or go back to their old right. jobs. But, but I, you know, I don't think. I mean, I feel that the staff that we have now are doing their job. I mean, like for example, I, I, I go out with a with, with a staff. I believe you, uh, people know who he is. Um, I can't re remember his last name, but his name is the first name is Kevin. He mm -hmm. used to work out in the out in um the main office with camp camp recreation. So I go out, you know, not only me, but he has a group on Mondays and you know Mondays. I'm in that group, but since we've been since we since two staff have left. This past year, he needed to like he yeah he's been going out for the time being, Mondays and Tuesdays because he had to cover for the other staff that left as well. And in a broader sense, we have lost a lot of, of oh. staff uh, due, yeah. to, mm -hmm. due to the pandemic. There were um, especially in in other uh, departments such as uh, residential and home care where people were you know. We were essential workers. We were going into people's homes, um, and unfortunately, where you know the, the the compensation from the from the state was not what I considered satisfactory personally. You know, we weren't um, we weren't able to pay people, you know, things like hazard pay that that I think they were really really deserving of to the extent mm -hmm. that that really should have happened, and a lot of people did leave, and um, a lot of folks um, received services over Zoom. Uh, instead, but it's really not the not yeah. the same. And you know, you've you've heard a lot of, and there are a lot of things that you know that affected our population in much the same way as others that that got a lot more news. Um, you know, some of our some 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 group homes that people live in are categories categorized by the state in the same way as nursing homes, um, and they were impacted by. COVID in exactly the same way. There are congregate settings with a lot of, of you know, people who have pre-existing condi conditions and are mm -hmm. likely to be heavily impacted by a disease. So it was, we were very heavily impacted. Um, yeah. Like everyone else was. When I, when I was referring to the IEP, I was really referring to goals. You know, we all strive towards goals and, um, and that's, you know, I know that the IEP is for Board of Education, uh, Department of Education uh, folks, but I wondered, do you do something like that and work towards goals? 
We do. Um, Victor, can I put you on the spot to talk about, about ISP meetings? Let me just go ahead. <laughs> oh, me? I yeah, know, yeah. I know, I know how it's like, you were talking about well, I was asking if I could put you on the spot again, so. <laughs> uh, yeah, we do have, I mean, throughout, I mean, when we was, when, when we was in person before this pandemic happened, um, like, for example, my camp manager used to come up to the building and we used to have um, life plan meetings, you know, because life plan meetings, because that's what they call it now. But as for the goals, I have been, I mean, I've been trying to improve with my, with my goals that I've been working on. That's going to take time, but I just had my life plan meeting about two weeks ago on Zoom, because that's what's been going on for, for the past two years. Yeah. So the short answer is yes. We, we do yeah. we still have uh, similar meetings to try and make sure that, that we're really helping uh, provide person-centered services and working on the things that they want to work on. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you Beverly. Um, I think I'm gonna put my hand down. <laughs> Um, Cynthia, do you have a question? And anyone else who's here who, who would like to share a question, please feel free um, for either of our guests. Let me unmute myself because I'll be rambling on talking to myself. <laughs> First of all, I want to say to Victor, I want to thank you so very much for coming on and talking about your experience with AHRC. AHRC is an organization that I have been um, uh, aware of for at least 30 years because when I, you know, my, one of my first um, experiences um, after graduating from college was that I worked for the Resource Training Center in uh, East New York. And we, what we did there was that we um, taught w world of work skills to the aged out um, special ed populations in the high school. So they came from the high school directly to us. And our job was to teach them world of work skills and also to place them in employment. So of course we had a um, job developer there um, who got fabulous jobs. I mean, we got really great jobs for our clients in places like the Apollo Theater, uh, places like Restaurant Associates, which, um, you know, they were open arms with our population. Um, following that, I went over to Goodwill Industries and I worked with every single population except the blind. And my job there was to do vocational testing with a new computerized system back in the day. I'm talking like 30 years ago, but we did computerized um, testing with every single um, special ed population in every high school in the borough of Staten Island. So this is something that is very meaningful to me when I hear Victor talking about that he wants, you know, the goal is to get a job. Uh -huh. Because, you know, the job is the most important thing. And I know supportive training because when we sent uh, people out on jobs, we sent them out with a staff job coach that worked with them. You know, I mean, there were many, many different job uh, placements that we did with, with the population but uh, somebody went with them and was with them for at least until they acclimated to the environment and they were travel trained and what, what have you. So, you know, this is very important to me, but my question is back in 30 years ago, when we were working with this population, nobody was getting paid minimum wage. So, that you know that my question is how do, how does that happen what, you know like what in what capacity minimum wage capacity 
are these people peers? Are there, you know, like, what is the situation? Because this is very astounding to me that when we're dealing with this population that people are making minimum wage, in what capacity? Uh, so, I mean, a lot of our, a lot of job coaches are being hired at, at, at minimum wage or very close to it, unfortunately. Um, it's just, it's been years of disinvestment from the state has gotten us to that point. Um, and it's, it's a huge problem that, that we're facing. Um, yeah, it, the, the, there's, it, it wasn't one single thing. It was a lot of, there's, the, the program should be growing every year as the population grows and as the cost Absolutely, of the Absolutely, and it's not increases. getting smaller. And, and those increases have not been, have, have not passed. They have not gone through. Um, they have not been included in the state budget. And that's, that's how we've gotten to the point where we're at now. So Matthew, I'll ask you one other question. Um, you know, you say that you serve people from all ages now. If you're not an aged out, you know, out of high school uh, person who is looking for work, what other, you know, population are you serving and where are you serving them? Because you, you mentioned something about going into the homes. Back in the day when I worked in, in this system, we didn't go into the homes. So, well, you know, like, what, what is that about? So there are um, some, there's, we have a department that does home care, um, which it's designed to assist people to just do daily, daily living skills at home. Um, so especially somebody who might be living in an independent apartment, um, they might need some help with, cooking, cleaning, making sure bills are paid on time, those sorts of things. Um, and home care staff will go to the home to assist people with that. But those people then, um, uh, would their um, disability uh, preclude them from going to work? I mean, are they getting home care because they're really not a population that's going to be employable? No, no, uh, I, they're totally independent. Uh, departments and so yeah they're, they're they're different departments so there are home care staff and then there are supported employment staff and you know a lot of people who are working successfully in supported employment might need a little help with something um, at, at home um, and it wouldn't pr preclude them from from working in any way so how many job developers do you have there helping people find them? I know that during COVID, mind you, I'm, I'm understanding that, you know, employment must have came to a grinding halt, but we're opening up again. And I see all of these restaurants um, and all of these businesses that they're like starving for people to work. Actually, so, it's, it's been really surprising. Um, employment programs uh, are doing... Have, have not seen the, the have, have been doing pretty well throughout. Um, and part of it is that, that the fact that everyone needs, needs someone to work and, um, and especially a lot of the, the stuff that we had been very good about previously. We operate a social enterprise program called Hudson River Services that specializes in janitorial disinfection, disinfection services. So which, saw immense growth during the, the pandemic because it was in such heavy demand. Um, Absolutely. So yeah, the- Especially in the schools. Yeah, we, we do a lot of work in the schools. We actually still do a lot of work with, uh, um, with restaurant associates as well. Okay. Um, that's, okay. You, guys, you guys started us off on the right path right there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Cynthia. And um, I just wanted to be cognizant of, of time and the time that you've given to us today. Um, Victor, you mentioned that you um, volunteer in the community and that you might have a question for us about places to volunteer in the community. Are, do you have a question for us? Like, or, or is there a place in the community where you like to volunteer that you'd like to share with us? 
I mean, I've been doing on Mondays with that staff that I have mentioned before. Um, and as a group, we've been going to um to um Wheels on Wheels, where you know we like before we were. I mean, I used to go out to deliver uh foods at you know out in the in, in different buildings, but because because of this COVID, they they have kept us inside of the kitchen and help like. Like for example, like last week I was helping um serving coffee, giving you know, giving giving it to customers. Uh we've been um there's there's you know, different things, you know, a lot of things that they need like like food services. I um like when I when I look to see how many people come you know, came in and how many people once lunch, me or a staff or or someone else will let them know how many trays do we need. Like if it was two, I would tell them two. If if it's three, I would tell them three. You know, like. But That's... I feel that um, since we are, I mean, I even spoke. You know, I, I talked to that staff yesterday, and I told them. That um, I have asked him. Uh, have there? I mean, is there any other volunteer volunteer sites? Because I know there's more, but I don't. You know, I don't know if there's enough different volunteer sites that we could do. I think. I think because I we're, think... you know because we're trying to give others other groups from our program to um you know a chance to do meals on wheels. Yeah. So I think I think one way that we would be happy to help is um, to share some organizations that are in our community. Um, after this call, we could we could get a list, I'm sure from Jeremy of some of the organizations in our district that are right in your neighborhood that I'm that I'm sure would appreciate. Um, having you volunteer, but it sounds like what you're doing is really important, helping to feed other New Yorkers. I mean, it is, but we have we have been doing this since January and mm -hmm. like January, February. So, but the group that I'm with on Mondays, we you know we're trying to find different volunteer sites that we could do each week, like each um you know like every two weeks on a month, you know monthly. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. We have a we have a lot of organizations in our district. And I think what we can do is pull together some names uh, of organizations and share those with you. Um, and well, and yeah, if I mean, that's fine. But um, the person that you really need to um, contact, I mean, we will. I mean, we do have a. a what do you call that? A uh, program developer? Is the, am I saying that right? Yeah, we're, we're, mean, we're on the we're on an email chain. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's I mine, mean, we so. have one. Yeah, and that's Mike. My, yep. Um, Mike, Mike's on the in email chain with Cindy. So yeah, we're, we're so if you awesome. have any ideas, you could just send the ideas to him because he's the one that reach out to the to every staff, and the staff tells us. That's that. That's what we'll do. And also, um, the second part of our meeting, one of our priorities is actually really to better support the disability service providers in our district, which includes mm -hmm. AHRC. Um, and also, we made a request this year as a community board uh, to have more services focused on employment for people with disabilities in the district. So those are a couple of the areas. Um, I do see that Melissa Del Valle Ortiz is with us and um, would love if you have a question, Melissa, um, if you could share that. And then Matt, if you can give us some recommendations before we wrap up about how we can support you. So, but first I'm gonna let Melissa jump in and share whatever amazing question and comment she has for yeah. you. <laughs> so um, I wanted to know if you could talk a little bit. I went to your, and I apologize for being late. I was on another call. Um, 
did you discuss about the college program that you offer participants? Um, I, I mentioned it very briefly in passing. So um, we have what we call the Melissa Ridgier Higher Education Program. Um, it's, it's in Brooklyn, it's at Kingsborough Community College. And there are also programs at the College of Staten Island, uh, Hostos in the Bronx and Borough of Manhattan Community College. Um, so Brooklyn residents are only eligible for the Kingsborough program. Um, they're very small programs. It's very tough to support people in full inclusion in college. Um, just there's a, a lot that goes into supporting somebody and, and it's, it's even more difficult to, to manage some of the staffing issues there. So we, we can only support uh, five students per school per year. So there's a, uh, you know, each school is supporting about 25 people. Um, we include the four years of college and then an alumni year where we focus on job placement um, in that program. And it's a certificate program. So um, the students technically audit um, all of their classes, but they're taking classes alongside um, anyone else who's going to Kingsboro um, with, uh, staff who is accompanying them and acting as a mentor um, and often as a note taker, a study buddy, um, and assisting to uh, where, and we primarily um, try to hire uh, enrolled students in the school of their choice when, when that's possible. Okay, and do your students participate at all or your participants participate at all in the AmeriCorps program? Um, I don't know of anyone who does, uh, but it's a big enough organization that there are a lot of things that, that may be going on that I'm not um, up on. So I can't, to, to my knowledge, no, but I, I have no certainty in that knowledge. I, I just, just for me uh, as an AmeriCorps participant, I think that that would be something or organizationally that you might consider applying for as an organization so that you can hire your participants in the program. It could potentially be, you know, a source of added value to them because they also then receive an educational stipend. Yeah. So depending, yeah, they, they will receive without, without it affecting any of their benefit, they'll still get 100% of their medical, they'll continue to receive their SNAP benefit, they'll continue to receive, nothing will be affected because the stipend that they receive is not considered income, it's considered a stipend. And so it's beneficial to them because it would advance their um, participation within the organization. You can maybe help to cultivate it in a way that allows them to be more um, socialized um, and, and experience the world depending on how you programmatically set up the, the, their participation. I also want to let you know that uh, the, and I apologize, I work for the Office of Congress Member Nidhi of Velasquez. Um, and there is a program, if you are servicing 14 to 24 year olds and they're participating in any uh, volunteer work, then the, our office is, has, has registered with the Congressional Award uh, for Civic, for youth, for 14 to 24 year olds. And they can sign up to for community volunteer hours and they will receive recognition by the federal government um, for their community service. Cool. So I'll, I'll be sure to send Cindy my well, Cindy has my information. She'll be sure to connect us in the email, but I would love to be able to um, have them have their participation, but, as, um, but also, you know, work to introduce you to the AmeriCorps VISTA um, arena, and then hopefully have your organization receive a grant. That would be really cool. I really appreciate that. Thanks so much. I never, I never actually thought that. I and while we're... Yeah, and while, while we're asking Cindy to share things, um, I uh, uh, am hoping that you could share the two one-click campaigns. Uh, 
sent you. The links are the same. We've update, we're updating the information um, when you click the links. But um, I personally work in advocacy. Um, and so we're, the, we have a couple of campaigns that we're, we're working on to try to make sure that the, the budget increases for direct care staff especially and several other asks. Um, uh, pay parity for our uh, special educators, um, an increase in the housing subsidy so that people can afford to live in their homes. Um, and we, ideal, we, we in previous years have, have made several trips to Albany to speak to le legislators in person. This year we're really leaning on these uh, digital options, the one-click campaigns and Zoom meetings to get the, the word out. Uh, actually, Victor, um, I think he was going to put me on the spot again. <laughs> there I am. Victor, if you, if you want to, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, some of your trips to Albany to meet with legislators? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I will. So, at, so uh, Matt was saying that um, like a couple of years back, I can't, I believe it was 2016, 2017, somewhere around it. Was the first time that I went. That was one of the ones that you know I got chosen to go up and talk to the legislators, and that was my first. But the one that I believe Matt is talking about is the one where I had to write a uh, a speech. Matt, I think you remember what speech that was. <laughs> it was you about uh, support of a. Uh, of employment for, you know, age, uh, information for uh, support of employment for for the, you know, other clients that needs it, you know, other people. And that year, well, that second year when I went up there, when I had to write that speech, let me just say the, first, the day that we arrived, I was nervous, you know, like I was a little nervous because I, you know, that was something that I never did before. But now, you know, in the near future, if I have a chance to do the same thing again, now I know, you know, I would know what to do because I have done that before. But that, you know, helped out because, you know, like when we was, when we was open before the, like a couple of years before the this pandemic happened, there was a lot of jobs. There was a lot of volunteering, but when everything, when everything, you know, got shut down, I feel that you know most of it, most of that was, you know, we lost, we lost it because um because of this pandemic and everything. That's you know that's the way I feel. So, yeah. Well, Victor, we'll get you back up to Albany as soon as it's safe to do so. You, Matt. Matt, I, I have the two links. And if you want to verbally kind of tell us what we're seeing here. So, um, uh, yeah, so this, this page is the, the probably most, most useful one because it, it's more, more regularly updated um, with a series of, of asks. So each of those is a one-click letter. Um, if you sign on and enter your information, including your address, it will, make, it will send a message to your legislator. There's a pre-written uh, message that's that's described, but you can edit it if you want to tweak the the ask or personalize it. Um, and it's just uh, an, an easy way that a lot of folks have have shared. It's like signing onto a petition, but it it makes it a little easier because it goes straight to your legislator and the leadership of the Senate and the Assembly to try and get a little more support to make sure that that we get the money to keep providing these services. And that's more or less the same thing. Um, and you can see the uh, asks to the left, the, uh, the COLA being the main one. And can you just, sorry, what does COLA stand for? Cost of living adjustment. Okay, okay, thank you. So you're looking for that, that to see this pass to, to ensure that the the payment that you had talked about for direct support professionals is adjusted for cost of living yeah. appropriately. Um, okay, thank, thank you so much. Um, is there anything else you'd like to 
ask us before you guys sign off, is there anything else we can do as a community board um, to support the work that you do at AHRC? Well, the only other thing that I was uh, going to add was that uh, to stay more involved in what's going on with, um, with providers and people with disabilities in the community um, is to be, uh, you could be involved with the Brooklyn DD Council or the Brooklyn Family Serv Support Service Advisory Council. And uh, Cindy, I'll send you an email with a link to their webpage because that could be. We'll send to... these out after and we'll put them in the minutes as well. If you can send us those that we'd love to get involved. Cool. Yeah, and, that, I, and I send you the link to the, the video of, of Victor in Albany if you want to see. I knew Victor you were going to exactly it. the same. And me with a little more hair. <laughs> okay, and and would you like us to to share that out after the meeting or? No. I, <laughs> no. Maybe, maybe just maybe just the one clicks in the uh, support service link. Okay. Let me see here. <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> it's okay. Let me see here. Victor, we're going to make you famous today. Um, Matt, I'm just trying to find it in the message. Message. Oh, I see. I see here. I sent it moments ago. Sorry. Oh, okay. That's okay. That's okay. Hold on one second. So I'm going to. Oh, this is so great. Hold on. Matt, what did you do? <laughs> oh, it's nice. <laughs> that is that is absolutely great. Thank you so much, Victor, for for going up to Albany and advocating. That's so important. And um, speaking of that advocacy, our our committee is focused on trying to make Sunset Park and Windsor Terrace more accessible and more more welcoming for people with disabilities and. You're always welcome to join our meetings. We'd love to have you. Same, same for you, Matt. We'd love to see you. Um, this is the clip right here. Yep. Okay. I didn't realize we also had a video clip. Okay, I'll share my sound. And then uh, I just realized I had to share my sound. But go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. My name is Victor Carrion. I go to Brooklyn EVS. I work at HRC as a receptionist for three days per week. I like my job because I get to help other people and support my family. Good afternoon, HRC. Because, you know, I don't want to be in the same place all my life. Victor wanted to go to Albany to advocate for employment training programs for other people. He had a long road to employment himself and wants other people to have the same opportunity that he's had himself. My name is Matthew Wiestep and I work with Victor Carrion uh, in the Brooklyn EBS office where he is our receptionist and is supported through the ETP program which I oversee. Victor's involvement with self-advocacy is a big part of why he was selected for the trip to Albany. We knew that Victor was very involved with speaking out for himself and representing other people with disabilities, which was why we thought he would be a great fit for the trip to Albany. Okay. He practices speech excessively every single day. Well, I appreciate you guys coming in. Yeah. And uh, I think what you're doing is very important, obviously, as self-advocates. But you're really advocating for a lot of other folks who couldn't be here today or who, who don't have the ability uh, to come up and, and, and talk to folks like me. And I think that's so important. And uh, I'm just happy to yeah. hear what you guys have to say. And, yeah. Well, and we're from AHRC New York City. Yep. All right. And we're, we're part of uh, Nice Arc Inc. Yep. Statewide, yep. you know, organization. And self-advocacy is a tremendous part of our organization, and it's just been growing and growing uh, with more and more people really kind of taking leadership roles with self-advocacy. Now we have a, um, each person has a little presentation yeah. to present yeah. to you. So our lead-off person. Hi, my name is Kristen Thatcher. I am a self-advocate. I get support from AHRC, and I, I work for AHRC. Oh, you do? Yes. How long have you worked for AHRC? So I worked for the AHRC for two years, okay. and I've been supported for eight years. Okay. So AHRC has had helped me a lot to get sure. where I am now. Sure. So my my issue is about self advocacy in public schools. Okay. 
for regular ed and special ed. Kindergarten all the way up to high school. So we need sure. people to understand uh, the um, our citizen rights. I don't think that happens in public schools. But I need I need your help to be able to get this into the, the system. That's that's that says a lot about you and, and your character, and and certainly probably is a reflection of your parents as well. So that's yes. that's wonderful. Um, and it says a lot about HRC yeah. mm -hmm. that you know you 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 find people and not only help them but then turn them into yeah. helping others. You know, right? this is I mean, really kind of her dream. So who should go next? Chad mm -hmm. right. 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 <laughs> Um Yes, I'm Chad Dorsey. I go to HRC book and they have. I'm a self advocate. Uh, last year I asked for a fifteen dollar minimum wage. Thank you for passing it, but I wanted to do more. I want to increase money for DSPs. DSPs don't make enough money. They get the how to pay bills and things. They just they need to support them more because they all leave to go to different jobs and new mm -hmm. jobs. They always, they always go to. See, it's a very interesting issue, and I'm sure you're aware of the Be Fair to Direct Care campaign, which is going across the whole state, and mm -hmm. the uh, the importance of kind of getting even past the minimum wage and getting to hopefully a living wage for the direct support professionals across all of New York State. So, who should go next? Um, my name is Andrino Martinez. I'm the secretary of the Soul Faculty Meeting, mm -hmm. and I'm here because the member of the Soul Faculty Meeting needs job. Cause a few right. people, a few people they don't have money because you know they're not working, and we need more money in the budget for help. They need jobs to go outside, you know. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So who should go next? <laughs> Forgive me, I'm, this is my first time giving a speech. Congratulations. So, Congratulations. <laughs> my name is Victor Carrion. I go to Brooklyn EVS to an employment training program. I am here to help other people to get jobs. I feel that everyone should have a job, but it's not easy to get, to get or keep a job. Now, I want you to put more money into the budget for more employment training programs for this way other people could get jobs that's right for them. So. <laughs> Good job! Victor really enjoyed the trip to Albany and really enjoyed the chance to meet the legislators. Uh, since then, he's attended the Brooklyn Legislative Brunch and is working with another one of our self advocates to plan another trip to Albany to do some more lobbying later this month. I really enjoy going to Albany and I can't wait to go to go back. Oh wow. Oh, thank wow. you. Thank you so much for sharing that with us and sharing that journey with us. And and Victor, thank you for all of your know, advocacy. I did not know Matt was gonna do this. I did that was I did not Thanks for helping you embarrass Victor a little. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you to you both. And um, Cynthia, um, we have to move to our next item on the agenda unless it's, okay. it's quick. But I, I just want to <laughs> say one thing. Yeah. Um, we had a sister, Sister Geraldine and Sister Mary Paul, who were the founders of uh, Center for Family Life. And one of the things that they always said that always you know, I, I took it to heart and I'm sure that everybody here is to take it to heart that there's nothing they can do more for a person than a J-O-B. So anything that we can do to help HR, HRC to progress their goals, count me in because I do believe that everyone deserves to have a job. Oh. That's all I wanted to say. <laughs> Thank you. That is that absolutely. Um, so echoing echoing Cynthia's statement there. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Um, and uh, Victor and and Matt, if you would like to stay with us, um, we have another item on the agenda um, that I would like to kind of move to. Um, and so you're welcome to participate in that process. Um, we are uh, in efforts to try to organize and focus our uh, work as a committee and also help get some focus uh, from our elected officials and agencies. Um, I pulled 
the accessibility related uh, requests that we made earlier this year as a community board in our expense and capital budget requests and put them into categories. And um, what, what I would like to propose to this committee is that we distribute a letter that articulates our priorities for this year, uh, really with an emphasis on those things, but also adding other items um, as you may see fit. Um, and so, uh, Joan, yes, you had a, a question. No, um, shall I show what 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 we have, and then um, let's let's start with that. I see thumbs up. When when you're ready, um, I, I have some items that I want to put in uh, in our priorities. Great. Okay. Thank you. So um, essentially this will be a letter. And the, the idea here is that, yes, it's, it, is, it is just a letter, but it's also a letter introducing who we are, what we've prioritized and asked for. And then it's about accountability, right? And, and it's accountability to us to keep our focus and it's accountability to um, government agencies uh, and, and elected officials. So these were, some of the areas, I didn't necessarily just organize them by committee per se. Um, and so let me, I, uh, we can see on the screen here that it'll have civic engagement, transportation, adult services and workforce development, uh, a topic we've discussed today, youth and education, public space, uh, parks and playgrounds. So in each of these categories, you'll see that um, for civic engagement, we asked for accessible restroom, or not asked for, uh, we actually were funded in 2014 to get accessible restrooms at the CB7 office. And that funding still hasn't been released. So if you use a wheelchair and you come to a meeting, you can't use the bathroom in the building and that's just not acceptable. And so we wanna see, we wanna get support and we wanna, make sure that all of our elected officials understand that we're still waiting on the release of these funds so that people can actually like come and use the bathroom when they come to a meeting. Um, we also are moving into a space. Yes, we've invested in some technology um, that's improved accessibility such as hearing loops and the high definition video, but um, we are doing an assessment and have discovered that there are some other needs, especially as we move into a high potential hybrid mode uh, or even offsite meetings. And so that's going to be additional expenses. Um, those were both included in our requests as a community board. Um, what was not necessarily, so anything you see in italics are in addition. So these are like ideas that I had, but happy to add some ideas that you have as well. Um, you know, it's one thing to pass legislation to require accessible meetings. It's another thing to actually fund the accessible accommodations, like to plan for that and have funding so that you can actually make meetings accessible. You need, you know, funding for that. So um, I thought we could add into this that maybe elected officials can support those types of allocations. Um, and then last but not least, ask that our, um, that offices and agencies are also planning for budgeting and implementing accessibility into public meetings. Um, it may be the law, but it's not always happening in, an, in, an, in a way that, 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 you know, I think a lot of us would like to see. Um, so those are, those, when it comes to kind of our priorities and civic engagement, those were the ones here. Um, uh, I see we have three hands up. Should I go through each of these first? Yes, Jeremy says yes. So I'm gonna follow his lead. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here we have um, transportation and safety. Um, and these again are informed largely by community board requests that have already been passed. So enhancing safety and accessibility at pedest pedestrian crossings. We specifically prioritized as a board Third Avenue from 17th to 65th Street, as well as underneath the Guanas Expressway and um, shorter streetlights to Third Avenue. It's not to say that we don't want these at other 
on other streets or other intersections, but these are the specific requests. And so we can follow up on them and continue to follow up on them. <laughs> That's kind of the idea. Um, then assign additional crossing guards throughout the district. This was also a request that uh, was included in our budget requests, as well as the other ones that we see here, prioritizing accessible subway stations. So the infrastructure bill passed, supposedly the 36th Street subway station should be getting an elevator and, and being ADA uh, compliant and accessible. I, it should be on the list. Um, from what we understand, 15th Street subway station might not be on that list. Um, and so those, we, but these are on our list. And so that's what we are including here. Um, I did put in italics, explore installation of ramps and stations wherever feasible. As a community board, we have asked for this from the MTA within transportation meetings, um, especially, um, I, th I think there was a meeting last year where this was discussed uh, in reference to the Fort Hamilton Parkway station. Jeremy, you wanted to jump in? Uh, we've also asked in the past, and I'm not sure if it's still on our list, but secondary egress at all of our subway stations. Okay, okay. So we can, we've, we've asked that before, we can put that, put that back on. My hand up. And, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I, I want to get through the whole list. Actually, I just wanted to make sure that there wasn't something that um, I was um, missing that 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 um, Jeremy wanted to respond to. Um, and then add shelters and benches to bus stops. Um, it's hard for a lot of people to stand for extended periods of time, especially now with reduced bus service. So um, we had included in our budget request every stop on B63 and every stop on Third Avenue. Um, also increasing bus service as an accessibility issue. Um, we, in our budget requests, included B63 and B70. Um, replace sidewalks that need replacement, Fort Hamilton Parkway between East Fifth and the, and the bridge over the Prospect Park Expressway. And then there were three items that were discussed at our last ability and access meeting when Brooklyn Center for Independence of the Disabled joined us. They discussed how with the authorization process for Accessoride, we're the only municipality in the state where you have to go in person, where a doctor or medical professional's letter is not good enough. It's good enough in other municipalities, but not in New York City. And so what happens a lot of times is people with an, an invisible or non-apparent disabilities don't get approved. Um, and so uh, reforming that authorization process uh, so that um, it is more accessible. Uh, and um, so that's, that's one suggestion. Um, another is uh, expanding Accessoride on demand. Now, if you remember, this is the service where right now it's being piloted and funded by the MTA. And this is where you pay $2.75 and you can um, get a ride from point A to point B on demand without having to plan days in advance to order your Accessoride. Um, so this is another thing that um, we're hoping can increase independence for um, people with disabilities in terms of their travel. And then last but not least, ensure that entrances to police precincts are accessible to people who use wheelchairs. Um, adult services and economic development. Um, so a lot of this we've all seen because of the um, budget, they, they, we've passed a lot of this. So the providing more vocational training, day hab and placement services in our district, um, restoring community-based employment training pr programs for adults with disabilities, and also free access to Wi-Fi, what a difference that would make for people that are working remotely. Um, as well as for educational purposes and many other reasons. Um, replace stairs with accessible pathway at the entrance to the Brooklyn Army Terminal at 63rd Street so that people who might work at the Brooklyn Army Terminal can actually um, easily access that entrance. Um, and of course, it also applies to people who have children who are going to the um, daycare or the pre-K services that are there and then support local employment programs for people with disabilities that integrate more with the actual like workforce development programs that are based in our district. So we want walk to work, 
for all residents, including people with disabilities? How can we do that better? Um, and then programs at senior centers expanded and enhanced. And I believe this is the last um, one in this, which is increased, increased funding for adult ESOL literacy and education programs. Youth, families, and education um, make all schools and facilities 100% accessible, fully fund programs for all who are eligible for specialized and related programs, allocate funds for additional training of school safety officers, specifically serving District 75 students, funding for after school music and arts programs, and then we have these uh, all these specialized programs, restore a five day a week pickup for all schools district wide. And this is the last slide, I promise. Um, housing, increased access. This is not in our request, but just a general sentiment. How can we get more accessible and affordable housing outlet that are both accessible and affordable housing options in the district? And um, so we, we are, it look, looks like we're getting this first one, knock on wood, we're getting close, fully fund Bush Terminal Park through phase two including an accessible playground. Feels good to have six, it feels good to see movement on some of these things. Replace sidewalks and curbs on East 4th, um, that should say street, uh, outside the community garden. Add accessible swings and other equipment to playgrounds in the district and allocate funds for new bathroom facility at Brooklyn Army Terminal Pier 4. I realize this is a lot to take in. I'm happy to pull up slides as you need them. Um, but let's go through, Joan, you've had your hand up. Um, would love to hear from you. Well, you know, one of my great pet peeves is that uh, the MTA now has completely discontinued um, transactions in the uh, customer service booths. And again, this is a big hardship for all people with disability, with eye disabilities. They have to use the machines. And if they can't see the machines, then what do they do? Okay, that's number one. Number two is the MTA is going to do away with all of the Metro cards. And they're going to go to credit cards. Seniors pay half price. How is that going to work for the seniors? Have they thought of that yet? They haven't so, mentioned it. So as a request, as a re like if we put this into the letter, um, I, this, this would basically what I'm hearing from you is that first of all, we'd like to see customer service options, right? That the customer service booths reactivated? Well, yes, I, I, I want it activated. Will they, will they do it? Well, here we go. This is another fight, I guess. But yes, we and have then, to start really thinking of people that are getting up there in age. Right. Those of us that are fortunate that have been able to get up there in age and have and have all of their faculties and their mobility but a lot of people don't have that right and 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 this this is becoming more and more of a hardship right so I, we're, it's uh, unfortunately we we're, we're a society that we don't take our mothers and my grand and our grandparents and 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 put them on a pedestal but it's it it's really time that everybody starts thinking when when you're 50 and then you turn around and then you're 80 and you turn around uh, when you're 30 and then all of a sudden you're 50 and and there's 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 it gets harder, it really does. 
I'm talking from experience. So Joan, I mean, would you feel comfortable with something that that is maybe articulated as like, you know, I mean, maybe it's even. If they have to have a machine, how about a talking machine? Right. Like, like that they should be building in accessibility considerations and the input okay. and input of, of seniors but as then well. On the flip side of that coin, even if it's a talking machine and the, the machine tells the person, well, now you have to press the red button or then you have to press the green button. How do people see the red button or the green button? Right, right. Um, yeah, and, and that's just like a not a, a good design, right? Because if you're colorblind, you can't tell the difference between a red and green button. So it's I don't know if that's the case in their current design, but maybe the ask here is that the MTA, um, you know, I, I, I just, if, if you can think about what, what, what are we, what are we wanting to ask like the MTA, I think it's engaging, maybe it's engaging seniors and well, people with disabilities more people, in these transitions. I'm sorry. There are people sitting in the booth. What mm -hmm. are they doing all day? Right. So reactivated. Right. Right. Is there anyone here who's um, on the call who would be opposed to requesting that MTA reactivate uh, the customer service booths? Um, is there anybody? It just just uh, absolutely, speak. absolutely. You, you're yeah, opposed. You're opposed to it. No, I'm not opposed to oh, it. I'm oh, okay. like totally for it. Okay, so I'm going to put that on the list then. Okay, so we're going to reactivate. And, we're going to request a, reactivating the customer service booths and a clear es explanation about the OmniCard. Right. I, I took the train Monday. And in the train, it had a chart. And with no wording. And you, you do this, it, you do this, and then it does that, and then it does that. People don't, can't say that with they disability. Need they need to make it more accessible and um, and, and comprehensible and user friendly. And send a letter that they have on file. Everybody that is a senior that ha that pays half price of the new system that's coming in, an explanation of the new system that's coming in, and how it's going, and and in the explanation. What the, what card, if you're using a credit card and you have to use the same credit card, which credit card are you going to use? Okay. I mean, I, it sounds to me like outreach and better explanation, especially outreach to seniors and a variety of communities and explanation. How it's going to work and how they will receive the half price. Okay. Okay. Is anybody opposed to that who's on the call? No, but can I add something on that? Yeah. Okay. So I share many of the concerns that Joan mentioned. Um, I live in a household with two senior citizens. Uh, well, I, you they have to questions. speak up, please. Oh, can you hear me? Is it that better? My audio not working? Hang on, hang on. Folks, if you're not currently talking, please mute. Is my audio better now? Okay, cool. So um, I share many of the same concerns that Joan mentioned. Uh, I live in a household with two seniors and I tried to navigate some of the system myself. And yeah, the Omni stuff is very confusing. Uh, I did manage to get the Omni card. I'm holding it now. But um, the Omni card, you have to go to a bodega or a uh, pharmacy to get. And that was uh, tricky and, and weird. 
and yeah, I think the outreach is definitely not there. So I would definitely, I would encourage um, Cynthia when you consider and Jeremy, uh, next time we have the MTA, then to do some kind of presentation on that because the monthly unlimited is not on there and neither is the senior one. And I couldn't find a timetable for when that's gonna happen. So I know they also said they're gonna switch their vending machines to Omni. I don't know when that's gonna happen either because I I definitely rather use the card than you know use it on the phone. And that, it makes it easier too because you can fill it with cash and it does become unlimited, but only after like 12 uses or something and only for a week. So it's definitely something I, I would support um, adding that to the, the list as well. Great. All right. And, and, and as long as is anybody opposed to adding that? All right, then we'll add it. Um, Victor, would you like to share something? Yeah. Um, I just, yeah. About the elevator situation, like, you know, down at, like, like down at, over at, like, you know, where 25th, 20, like 25th, 36th, and uh, 45th and 53rd Street. Is there any way, you know, is there any way that they could, like, um, put, like, either a uh, escalator or elevators at the, those um, train station as well? We would love to have them at all of the stations. So no, I think that's what I'm trying to, yeah, that's what I'm trying yeah. to say because I live in, you know, I live at home with, with my mom and she is a uh, disabled person as well. She cannot walk up or down the stairs, you know, up or down the stairs. And if she, you know, and if there's an elevator in that, at that trade station that we could go and, you know, and, and uh, an escalator, that would definitely help, help out because she can because her legs is bad. She cannot walk up or down the stairs. No, yes. she could, but she would have to take, you know, her time walking. And sometimes she, she, she gets most, she gets, pain most you know most of from the legs and you can ask matt because matt saw my mother when you know when she came up to my um my animal meet at one time yeah so so victor thank you and if is anyone opposed to uh, me putting language in the subway section that we would like to see all of the subway stations in the district be fully accessible. Um, uh, so we'll put that as a priority. And then we'll also note the two that we have already asked to have funded to make sure that, you know, you do, you kind of, Victor, they move one at a time, but we're right. going to ask for all of them. I think that's a very good idea. Is anyone opposed to that that's here? Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and so I want to be cognizant of time because I know we have a community board meeting tomorrow evening <laughs> is the monthly meeting, but I would like to hear, I'm, I know, I know, Karen. Um, so I would like to hear from um, Matt, you have your hand raised. Well, I just wanted to speak to uh, Joan's concern with the accessible uh inaccessibility of the vending machines. Um, the MTA has tested some, they do have them, they're just not rolled out in most places. Um, and that might be another solution. Um, J Street Metro Tech, uh, they tested a series of accessibility features, um, but then it didn't, I didn't, before the pandemic, and then it just really felt like that didn't go anywhere beyond the system. And a lot of accessibility moved to the back burner with the departure of Andy Byford. And also on the um, Omni concerns, um, we've had some folks from the MTA come directly to help folks to get get their Omni cards, learn how to use them. Um, and that might be a possibility as something that you could do within the community board as well for the people there who might be struggling with the same issues that you're facing. That's a great idea. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that input and feedback. Um, John DeLooper. Okay. Uh, I had a couple questions on some of the slides there. Mm -hmm. First. Um, the question about uh, secondary egress on the subway thing, that was, does that mean reopening or uh, the closed entrances like on 45th Street? Um, I know that I think that was Jeremy. That was the idea uh, when the board voted on those. Okay, cool. And then the other question about the uh, accessible accommodations for the board meeting, does that include accessible funding for interpretation? 
Yeah, so I mean, accessible so my accommodation. My hands up on that one. I'd love to speak to that on that specifically. But the all of um, that <laughs> is very important. Okay. Yeah, I mean, accessible okay. accommodations, according, you know, by according to the ADA, include anything from ASL interpretation to if someone is blind and they need Braille printed materials. Um, it can be CART, which is communication access, real time translation, which is uh, basically it's like captioning, but there's a professional captioner. Um, so there's a range of, of accommodations that could be requested, um, but that includes American Sign Language interpretation. Um, and, and, you know, in terms of like budgeting for interpretation, we as a community board also have to think about language access too, right? So it's language access uh, as well as, as ASL. Um, yeah, Jeremy. For a tiny agency like ours with a great need for language access, budgeting does not handle it. Um, we had one meeting this year with, uh, for three hours that we provided translation services to. That took up almost 5% of our entire off salary budget. That was for three hours. We have requests for having all of our meetings in multiple languages. The next two weeks alone, we will have 16 to 20 hours worth of meetings. That would be almost our entire budget for the year. So it needs to be off budget because different boards have different needs. We have at least two languages that we have to translate to. Some may have none, some may have five, but I think it needs to be off budget. There needs to be some sort of language access service available to community boards and other agencies. Right. So and please don't call it a budget item. Okay, so it's we, a city we're, budget item, but not for the community board. So we're going right because I think I think the key here, and and you're getting at this, Jeremy, is that there's a systemic problem where there's the expectation that there are the funds somehow to support all of these accommodations, and we don't just want to like talk the talk. We want to be able to actually support accommodations. So exactly. Um, so some of this is going to need to. Would this be um. So, so we need to tweak the language so that it's not, and you can help with this. Right? I don't so want them putting money into my budget because they would put the same amount of money into everybody's budget and it would be an average and our need is greater and we can't afford it now. And we wouldn't be able to afford the access we would need if we get the average of what every community board gets. Okay, That's but, why but I think it needs to be a general fund item that we're able to tap into like community boards, we don't pay, we're in a city building, we don't pay rent. Some community boards have exorbitant rent, especially ones in Manhattan, but that doesn't come out of their budget because it's different levels for each board. I think it needs to be the same for this. Okay, so you're gonna, is anyone opposed to having Jeremy help us phrase this so that we're able to get funding both for language interpretation as well as in the longer term American Sign Language interpretation accommodations and other accommodations. Say, Cindy, I think that's the same thing, not in the longer term. We should, that is a service that should be available. And if it's one that we pick that we feel we need or any board feels they need, it should be available. It should yes. be one and then the other, it should be equal. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you for refining that that language. And I'm sure when we write the letter, you'll be able to help us yeah. phrase that in the proper way. Um, is there anything anything else that um, people would like to contribute that would like to have included? Well, can can I just say I have a few more specifics, but I, I can. Yeah. Time is of the essence. I, I mean, I can email them to you and Jeremy if that's easier. No, no. Please say them now. Okay. So then in that case, um, transportation uh, for the accessible buses, I would encourage you to add um, suggestions about uh, adding bus boarding platforms or bus borders wherever possible. For increased bus service, I would also push for the, 30, the B37, which is scheduled for every 20 minutes on weekdays and every half hour on weekends. That is, in reality, it doesn't come anywhere near that a lot of the time. Um, and then for parks, um, I know that this committee in the past studied bathrooms in the park, but to my knowledge, most of our parks that do have bathrooms don't have any changing tables in them. 
And I don't know if that's something that uh, could be added or something that could be considered in this kind of request. So I would encourage that as well. Is anybody opposed? Sure. Okay. <laughs> Is anybody opposed to any of the recommendations that John made? Is anyone opposed to any of the right any of the recommendations I put in italics on the slides? Do I need to show them all again? No. Okay. <laughs> Jeremy, what's up? It just struck me when John brought up public uh, bathroom accommodations. Uh, we had a bathroom uh, access uh, meeting a few months ago, and since we're asking for lots of other stuff in the subways, everybody needs the bathroom. Why don't we ask for bathrooms in our subways again? Okay. Is exactly. anyone opposed to that? In our subways. How about public, more public restroom access in general, including in the subway stations where they already exist? Okay. All right. Is that, I realize there's much more, right? But like, we've got to start somewhere. <laughs> and so we're going to send, we're going to send, we're going to, I'm going to craft the letter and um, we will send this to send it out. And, and Jeremy, do we need to vote on this? So some of these we had previously voted on, uh, uh, but some of these are new items. And since they are, uh, uh, but there are budgetary implications. I would suggest that there's a vote on this. Okay, so um, do I need to re, do I need to go through and say everyone? Uh, you could do that, or you could ask your board members to allow you not to do that. Could I, could I ask everyone to allow me not to do that? <laughs> is there anything that I talked about that anyone- Speak, speak now or forever to? hold your peace. Um, because if if what I, what I can okay so what I'm gonna do for tomorrow for the for the um for what I propose is that I will pull together this list that includes your suggestions as well as some of the ones in italics that I included. Those are all items that the board as a whole has not necessarily voted on, and so whatever we have not voted on, I'm gonna bring. And then everything that we've already voted on, like the budget requests, we do, we can still we just put those in the letter. Um, <laughs> so, but if there's there are new things, which there are, I'm going to put them in a list, and we're going to propose as a committee to the board that we want to include them in our letter tomorrow. Okay. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. That's okay. No. Cindy, are you yes. asking for a vote tonight? Yes. I would so like to vote on that. you just made a motion? Am yeah, I so my motion is to do that. Oh, Melissa has a question or a point of order. But, yeah, just, just one thing just came Back to here. mind. We haven't, we, I do not recall, I, I remember a super long time ago, we wanted to define what disabled, the definition of disability was, right? When we speak to this. But I, I want to, like, if there is any way that we can do a, um, what is that at the end when it explains all the acronyms? Oh, like um, a table of, no. Karen, go for like it. A re Karen, just glossary. like a resource. Definitions glossary. And like a glossary, right. Where we say, okay, it's, it's a, uh, disability includes veterans, seniors, people born with, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and that we make sure to include veterans in that. Um, yeah. In the def in 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 the definition of that was it. Thank you. Sure, we can do that. Karen. Okay. Okay. All right. So I make a motion to put all the new thing, all the new proposals. Uh, to to bring them to 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 incorporate them into the letter, um, and to bring them to the board tomorrow night. Um, is anyone opposed to that idea? I second your motion, and I agree. Okay, awesome. And um, I just want to thank. So, uh, does that mean is anybody opposed? So you're asking for unanimous consent. I'm asking for unanimous consent. So anybody who <laughs> disagrees can uh, speak up now. 
Not disagreeing, no, but I can agree. you just make sure that the definition of disability includes those visible and not visible? Yes, yeah, sure. Sure thing. So, so does anybody disagree with uh, unanimous consent on this issue? Cindy, I haven't heard anybody. You could declare it. The is motion suppressed. carries. Thank and you. I would like to make a motion to end the meeting. Do we need to do that? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for coming, especially Victor and Matt and, uh, and everybody else, too. Thanks Good so night. much. See you tomorrow. Good night. Good night. Get Thank some you. rest, Good night. everyone. Good night. <laughs>